<laughs> oh, this Rogue Procaster settings. I accidentally pressed the button. Welcome gamers, it's time for another NAG show. In this interview focused episode, we talk to three interesting people about three very interesting topics. First up, we chat to Neo from The Overclocker about the new Intel Arc A750. He also has one of these budget gaming cards, so we decided to compare notes. If you're wondering whether this graphics card is for you, this is a segment to watch. Then we chat to Ryan, Greybeard Hogarth, about Rocket League and the competitive scene in South Africa. And finally, we chat with our very own Cody on his adventures in 3D printing. We've all been curious about the technology, so now we're living vicariously through his investments in 3D printing. Stay tuned for that later in the show. But first, how good is your video game knowledge? Think you know your stuff? See if you can answer these gaming questions in this week's Quest for Knowledge. Question 1. What was the first game to use polygonal 3D graphics? Question 2. What is the best-selling video game of all time? And question 3. What is the name of the main villain in the game, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time? No googling now, we'll give you the answer at the end of the show. Stay watching until after the credits. With that out of the way, let's talk about the new Intel Arc A750 and get some more insights from Neo from the Overclocker about this impressive graphics card. So Neo, you also got your hands on the Intel Arc A750 GP recently. And um, I watched your video on the Overclockers, really great, uh, really great insights into it. Um, but I also wanted to just have a chat with you. We always do these tech chats about the technology. I want to get your insights uh, firsthand and uh, yeah, see what you think about the car because I certainly loved it. How are you doing, man? Yeah, I'm already saying you, Reichard. Glad to lekka, be here. Lekka. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you've played with the Intel Arc. Yeah, how's it been going? It's been pretty awesome. In fact, it was great up until the Last of Us PC came out port because that just really showed that you need more than 8 gigabytes of memory on a GPU. But it's only one game that's like that right now. All the other mm. games don't seem to have a problem with 8 gigabytes. And... Again, this A750 is meant to be for 1080p, maybe 1440p gaming. So at that resolution, memory isn't, isn't really much of an issue. That one game is the exception. But yeah, other than that, I've been having quite a decent time with it. And I still can't believe the price. At 5999, I think, at Woodworth. That's incredible. It's absolutely amazing price. Yeah, look, I mean, for anybody that kind of isn't quite sure where this card sits in the range, I mean, this is this is a budget gaming card or a mid-range gaming card, right? It's it's definitely not intended to give you the 4K gaming graphics, 4K gaming capabilities. But to be honest with you, with all my rigs and, and all the gaming that I do, it's 1080p in any case. Um, in fact, Len, the publisher, is going to buy one for, for, one, of his, for one of his kids' computers. Um, it'll be a massive upgrade from where they are. Um, and for six grand and what you get, I mean, you, you certainly can't go wrong there. Oh, yeah, definitely. When last did we were able to buy any GPU for six grand? I mean, its direct competition is the RTX 3060, um, mm -hmm. ideally the 8 gigabyte, but the 12 gigabyte version. And even the cheapest one I saw is at least two grand more expensive than the Arc GPU. And it's not necessarily faster. In fact, in my testing, I find that it's actually about the same speed and the arc can tend to be a bit faster in, in many tests, right? Mm. Sometimes it's not, as, it's not as fast, but a lot of the time it's actually the same speed or higher, especially at 1440p. I don't know why, for some reason, it seems to excel at 1440p and it's even worse. It's even faster at 4K, but of course, those are not, that's not a resolution that's playable. You know, Engineering, but, eh? I mean, we never know. But one of the things that was was quite interesting to me from 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 the early onset of the the release of the card was the driver issues, and they've been improving quite a lot since then. I mean, the drivers are quite. I mean, there's still some issues there; those pop ups that happen all the time. I don't know if they have fixed that yet, but you know, every time there's these pop ups at the bottom of your screen. Um, but do you think there's a lot more headroom in the performance of this card based on the driver updates that they are still able to do? I think so. Actually, I, I, I genuinely think so. This, right now, we're dealing with drivers that are essentially super new. And I mean, I've tested from the initial launch driver, comparing it against the most modern driver. I think that's 4257 or something at the at this time when we're talking about mm -hmm. it. And the differences are quite massive, not only in terms of stability, but in performance as well. We all know that with DX9 performance, they really did a lot of work there. So they were showing performance improvements of up to 43% versus the launch driver. And that's huge gains. But even in DirectX 12 games as well, I've seen even in synthetic tests, like 3D Mark scores just keep continuing to increase. 
and that just speaks to driver optimizations. I'm not sure how much more they can extract from it, but I definitely know that it's not the most that they've gotten out of these things, at least out of these two GPUs, the A770 and the A750, which are very, very similar. Mm. Yeah, we're using it in the in the Intel NUC still, and man alive, that thing does is a little killer of a of a you know for basic machine. Its performance is high, gaming capabilities is mid range, but uh, it works really well. One of the things that has me most excited about these cards, though, is the AV1 encoding that OBS has now implemented, and I believe there's some trials happening with YouTube that allows gamers or streamers to stream in this new AV1 codec directly. Um, th- that's quite exciting, right? I mean, I'm not sure if you've picked up much of, of that side of the story. Oh, yeah, that is one of the actually selling features of this GPU because which other one has this AV1 uh, hardware decoding and encoding? Not many. I think the right? 4090, fact, the 40 series cards have them, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. It could be 40 series, but what is the entry price on 40 series cards, oh, yeah. you know? So Very it's significantly thing. higher. And even with... The replacement for the RTX 3060, the 4060, it's still going to be at the very least twice the price of mm. the ARC 750. So the fact that you have AV1 engine like in hardware is something that a lot of streamers should appreciate. And if you think about it, if you're streaming at 1080p and because that's what you're playing at, the yeah. encoding is perfect for you, right? It's perfect. There's no performance loss on your side. And it's actually built into the hardware, so it's all hardware efficient. You know, it's not software and so forth. So I think that's actually a killer feature that perhaps Intel isn't selling as well as they should, at least to the right demographic. In fact, I find this generally with this entire GPU, like it's almost as if Intel is not really sure how to position it. And yet it's so good, it's better than the marketing around it. Way better than the marketing around it. I think, I think they're taking a very cautious approach to this. They're not trying to go out there and claim the world because also they haven't released the the high end version of the arc graphics cards yet um and there right. could be potentially i mean i think that's going to be the thing that's going to kind of cement their entry in a way i mean they're doing well with what the the cards are releasing now but the high end what is it the a770 right well the a770 is still according to the intel roadmap still part of the performance segment with the a750 uh the um, mainstream segment which is below this is for the a380 okay. so they don't have the enthusiast market yet but from what we've seen it looks as if they'll have an actual enthusiast market gpu in q1 2024 when battle mage which is the code name for our battle mage gpus come out and those will occupy that segment in the enthusiast market Right. But at the end of this year, we're still going to get updates to these GPUs in the form of Alchemist Plus, which are just refined versions of these GPUs. So there may be a lot to look forward to and in terms of driver development as well. And with that refined hardware, you might actually end up with GPUs that are somehow breaking into that high end space, but at perhaps on the lower end of that scale. You know, So I'm thinking maybe something like RTX 3070 Ti performance, maybe even 3080 performance. So that is quite possible right now, but we'll just have to see when Intel makes those announcements. But it shouldn't be far for now. I'm really excited about this overall because of the lower price entry. Um, And it's exciting to see that there's another plan now, and hopefully that will um, have some impact on the overall pricing market. Hopefully the other guys will try and be a bit more competitive. Oh, definitely. I mean, if you consider as well that the A750, one of the key things about it is that um, the Intel's XESS right, technology works very similar to DLSS. In fact, in terms of performance and image quality, it's closer to DS- DLSS than FSR. So meaning that even in ray tracing performance, you'll notice that the A750 is actually stronger than the 6000 series from AMD, which is really impressive for a first time attempt. And Intel is doing it for the first time and they've got better ray tracing performance. You add the abilities of XESS, which again, better than FSR, you actually have a GPU that is, for all intents and purposes, better at future games than what AMD is offering. And again, that is super impressive given that it's their first rodeo. But of course, on the NVIDIA side as well, they've got a little bit more advantages, right? But I think by next generation, it could be very even. 
we'll have to see about that. But yeah, I'm really impressed by the ray tracing performance of the 750. I didn't expect it to be this good. Mm, yeah, I agree. I agree. Least. I mean, Cyberpunk looks beautiful on there. Now, oh, yeah. one of the yeah. things, yeah, I mean, that's what we play. One of the things um, about the high end market, though, is it's kind of you throw money at it and you'll get the best and it's fine. But I find the real impressive work happens in this mar- in this part of the market, the entry level budget range. What can you squeeze out of, you know, what is that performance you can squeeze out of hardware that doesn't cost you an arm and a leg? And I think I've always been playing in that space. I mean, I can't never, re- I can't afford high end hardware. I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm in the industry that I'm in. Um, mm. You know, it becomes a bit more accessible. But whenever I've bought hardware, and it's other secondhand stuff that I've bought or whatever has been new, it's been certainly entry level to budget range, but with good research and understanding of what you get for your ma- of money, right? Not chasing the, not chasing the label of getting the 30 or 40 series cards. I think there's, there's a lot of potential there and there's a lot of gamers there that's very hungry to spend their money wisely. Oh, you're definitely right about that. I mean, if you think about it, it's been a long time since we've been able to get a graphics card for under 10 grand and a decent one ever since the, crypto market people started mining and so forth we've been just experiencing excessively high pricing and that hasn't changed even right now uh nvidia is apparently planning on introducing an rtx 4060 at about four triple nine or something of that nature which is incredible because four triple nine used to be where high-end cards used to be now yeah. you're getting entry well mid-range cards for that sort of money. And I think this is where uh, the Intel can actually take it from the other two competitors, because if they can offer their high end versions of the card for under what, $600 or at the $500 mark, I think a lot of people will come across to Intel because as it is right now, the graphics card market is essentially broken. Prices are not matching what people are capable of spending. And I'm even a personal example of that. I ended up with the PlayStation 5 because I had to do the calculation. Am I going to spend 15, 16 grand on a GPU, which isn't the best, or am I going to go and buy a console? And it turns out the console was actually the better option. But if you have something like the Intel Arc A750, well, it actually brought me back into PC gaming as well. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can actually recommend this for people without breaking the bank you can get a whole gaming computer for 15 grand or so because the graphics card is only six grand of it whereas before the entire gpu was 15 grand right if you go with nvidia and amd you're going to spend that much just on the gpu alone and i mean what is the point of that you know just in terms of cost effectiveness not many people buying computers for their kids are able to justify just one component for that sort of money so Having the A750 is a real alternative for many gamers, particularly in SA where we're super price sensitive. Yeah, I agree. And the card looks nice and stealthy too. It's just, I, I don't know how you feel about the lack of RGB on the, on the, on the one that we got, the A750. But um, yeah. yeah. I, I liked like the design. Yeah. It's so elegant. It's such an elegant design. And just even the finishes, it just really feels so good. The simplicity of it means that it will work on in almost any rig. I understand some people would be like, oh, this is a bit too dull, but I actually think it's, I think it's elegant. That's what it is. And the A770, the ARGB model, the 16 gigabyte one, has all the RGB lights and so forth. And that looks great as well. But I have heard that you actually need an extra USB cable to make use of the RGB on that, which is kind of why. You know, so the A750 has some advantages, even though it doesn't get all the lighting. I think it's tastefully done, particularly because the Intel Arc logo actually lights up. It's not mm. RGB, but it does yeah, light up. There's an Arc logo you... on the side. Yeah, yeah, very bright. Yeah. Yeah, look, about, so about, I'm, I'm really I mean, it. for for its intended market, it's it's more than sufficient. Um, and we'll certainly be enjoying it. I mean, that thing is now running in my, my rig here. Um, and I've upgraded from a 1070, which I still think is a phenomenal card. Like, I didn't, not, not that I play my high-end games on there, but all the production I do on there, all the kind of mid-range gaming when people come over that happens on that machine, it's a perfectly capable card. Obviously, the 20 series now is probably one where you want to look at if you're looking at second hand. Um, but yeah, you can get away with a lot of good stuff if you, if you want to look, spend your budget wisely. Oh, yeah, totally. I think, in fact, I would even say the 750 makes a better case for itself than anything 2000 series if only because of uh, power consumption. It's not the greatest on the A750, but better than the 2000 series. 
And compared to the RTX 2060, for instance, the A750 is way faster, way, way, way faster. And I know people who are still gaming on an RTX 2060. So the performance actually is there, believe it or not. It really is there. I was playing um, Metro Exodus, the enhanced edition, and just for interest sake, I turned up ray tracing to ultra mode and all those things at 1080p. And I was still getting a good 70 frames per second or something like that at 1080p, you know, which is phenomenal. Again, much like in Cyberpunk, this card seems to do particularly well. And in some instances, even matching an RTX 2080. You know, so I think that's a really good position to be in, given that it's an entry level card, right? Mm -hmm. 5999 is something that is attainable for most people. And to get that sort of performance, there is no other card that will give you that price and give you that performance. It just simply isn't. Yeah. You know, so this one for up. me is a real winner. You know, it really is a winner. So if you guys want to find out more about the technical side of things, Nair did a very nice in-depth uh, video review on it um, on theoverclockers.com. So we'll put the links up and go check that out. We also did uh, some video features on the previous NAX shows. So if you've missed those, go check those out. Did some benchmarks and kind of showed you a bit more about the, the card and installation. Um, it's certainly exciting times. We as techies are very excited about this uh, development and uh, we look forward to, yeah, to getting our hands on, on more of the newer hardware and, and seeing what Intel gets up to in the future. Definitely. Definitely. Thanks for your time, Naya. We'll uh, game very soon. I think we should go dual arcing. Find oh, a game. Yeah, Let's go play awesome. some Fortnite or something <laughs> and uh, battle it out with the arcs. Yeah, that would be awesome, man. All right, then. Thanks. Thanks for having me over. I've long been curious about Rocket League and recently started playing the mobile version, Sideswipe. Our next guest is deeply involved in the local scene as a content creator and advocate for competitive gaming for young people, especially non-violent games like Rocket League. So with me right now, we have Ryan, a prolific gamer. Is that the right word? Prolific gamer. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 play, I play one game, but I play it a lot. So maybe I'm, I'm a prolific gamer. Rocket League gamer. <laughs> yes, okay, that's a prolific Rocket League gamer. Now, yeah. don't hate me, Ryan, but I have caught a fancy to Rocket League Sideswipe. I don't know if you know Ooh, that. Oh, okay. The mobile version. And it's been insanely addictive. I never, I never kind of got into the PC version, but I must be honest, it looks insane, like a sane amount of fun. Um, how did you get into that? So, I mean, my, my, my love affair with Rocket League began in 2015 when I was, I was at an interesting time. I was trying to find entertainment alternatives. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I'd had enough of series and movies, and it was all becoming, uh, I guess, a little bit stale. So, so my son, who at that time was sort of 17, 18, no, no, he was a bit old. Anyway, he was, he was a gamer. So I thought, you know, I, I had played games in the 80s, the late 80s, and hadn't been near gaming in like 25 years. So I thought, well, maybe maybe I'll enjoy gaming. So I put together a very cheap gaming PC and experimented with a bunch of games, uh, mostly like the story type games, Tomb Raider, Hitman, yeah. that sort of thing. And they were they were fun, but, you know, not not captivating. And then I felt I came across almost by chance. I came across Rocket League. And and I don't know what it was about it, but I kind of fell in love with it, and and that has been the game I've played for the last seven years, and uh, it's absorbed far too many hours of my time. Look, there's a there's a lot of us out there. I also have one or two games that I linger around for mm. the last few years. It's I mean, they, they, it, it's nice. It's nice to have something that's comfortable to go back to. You know, yes. that's your jam. Um, yes. So, I mean, what is it about what is it about Rocket League that appealed to you? Is it the soccer aspect of it? Because that's quite a nice mechanic to it. Yes, I, I, I think first and foremost, um, to to my brain, for some, it, it looked visually appealing. It just looked like these amazing things you could do in game. But I think principally what kept me engaged is how short the games are. You know, a game of Rocket League is five minutes long. You know, with replays and overtimes or whatever, you're looking at about seven minutes if it goes the distance. So it was it was something that, you know, whereas if you're playing Tomb Raider or Hitman or these other story games, I mean, you could have short sessions, but it was very involved. Um, whereas this was like an instant, the dopamine came hard, it came fast, and then you were done, and it was enough that... You, that you jumped right back in. I mean, you never you never go in and play one game. You end up being there for two, three, four, five hours, whatever it is. But it's those short bursts of of, of dopamine is what I think appealed to my shortest a short attention span brain. 
Nice. Now, you, look, you certainly caught on to a very popular game. There's no doubt about that. But you've mm. also taken this further, right? I mean, you're not just a avid gamer. I mean, you're actually quite involved with uh, the league of Rocket League. So I, after four years of playing the game, pretty much casually on my own, I wasn't involved with the community. It was literally how I burnt my idle hours. But after four years of that, I had this thought that with all the time I'm spending with it, I either need to find something more productive or make this productive. So I thought, okay, well, let me start a YouTube channel. I'll, I'll, let's see if I can be the oldest grand champion in the world. At that time, I was about 47. And, at, uh, and, and if I'd become a grand champion at that time, I would have been the oldest. So I started a YouTube channel to kind of document my, my journey of becoming a grand champion. And it quickly became clear that it was going to be a lot harder than I thought. Um, but I kind of just continued. And through that, I I, I got involved in the broader community in South Africa. Um, but it was a, a, a Rocket League has been a niche game. It was a very small community just because we weren't, we had no real path to be in the esport world championships or anything like that. That all changed at the end of, t toward the end of uh, 2021. Where are we now? Yes, 2021, where we were included in the World Championships and South African teams or Sub-Saharan African teams have a path to play in the World Championships. And so I got really excited about that just because I'd, be, I'd come to know the superstars of the game and it was frustrating to see them reaching the peak and then there was nowhere for them to go. There were no competitions. VS Gaming and Telcom were involved, but that was really the only thing going. So there was really nothing to grind for. Suddenly, it just opened up. And the prize pool instantly is like this two and a half million rand prize pool. Um, suddenly, all these kids who had been grinding this game were scrambling to make teams because they had something to play for. And that got me very, very excited. So I, through that, became involved in, I guess, just being an evangelist for the community. I, I want our top players to be superstars. I want the scene to grow. I want there to be thousands of Rocket League players. Yeah. So I've sort of, it's given me, it's just given me something to do other than just grinding the game or playing the game to to try and see the growth of this community in the region. So if anybody out there is very keen on getting into Rocket League or already playing Rocket League and want to take it further, where do they go? What's well, the next step? So, so Rocket League is free to play. It's free to play across all platforms, Xbox, PlayStation, Switch, and of course, uh, PC through Epic Games. And the biggest complaint I've heard is that th there are no transferable skills. So if you're CSGO, PUBG, Valorant, uh, all of those skills you've learned to like aim and kill people uh, doesn't really transfer. So you're the, the biggest frustration for people who've gamed for a long time is that you're learning something completely new. Um, whereas if, if you're... If your gaming path has been otherwise is probably not as frustrating but uh, but really it's free to play so you know get onto the epic store and, and download or playstation wherever you get those games it's pretty easy to find and and give it a give it a proper chance because initially it is frustrating it's remarkably hard when you've never played it you wouldn't think it'd be that hard to hit a ball on a field but it is but give it the time give it a proper shake because once it grabs it is a an astonishingly uh, amazing game to play so once you're hooked where do you go where do you go from here to take your 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 casual gaming further all right. Well, there are a number of communities that are building up around Rocket League and, and you know, on Discord. I, ha I have a website, which is greybeard.gg, which, uh, which is really just a curated website of, of links to content creators, uh, communities on Discord. So whether you want to play casually or you're looking to get into the competitive scene or just want to hang with people and play, there are a number of communities. And that's probably a, a, a good place to go. You'll get all the links of, of communities you can get involved in and content creators people who do tutorials and you know all the all the good things that uh, good gaming content creators do to if you're looking to get better at a game and improve nice now is there anything notable coming up that's worth mentioning in terms of tournaments or events within the rocket league community 
Yes, absolutely. Right now we have the, the Telcom VS Gaming uh, League ongoing, which stretches for the better part of a year. We're sort of coming to the last phase of that, um, the, uh, yeah, which will be played over the next couple of months. But then the big one is the Rocket League Championship Series, uh, which is local players vying for a spot in the World Championships. And the, the final split of the season, which comprises three individual tournaments, starts on the 12th of May. The qualifiers for that are the weekend before open qualifiers on the 5th of May. And then, yeah, so those three tournaments will run through May, early June, and then it's World Championships, which is, I believe, probably going to be in Europe somewhere. We're waiting for the announcement on that, but that'll be in early August. Nice, fantastic. Well, look, I certainly look forward to uh, learning some tricks from you one day. Um, maybe I'll turn it to you with to pleasure. a virgin online stream and then see. Let's see how, how good my side swipe skills have transferred to the uh, to the PC game. Yeah, Ryan, I, I, I'm, you I'm, you. I'm very pleased by the way that you've played side side swipe. It's it's, it's great. I, 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 so you said don't hate me. I don't at all. I think it's awesome. <laughs> but 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 I, I, hopefully we can rope you into the the big version. No, I'm going to download it now. I need to play it. I mean, after yeah, after this conversation, it certainly feels like uh, I'm, I'm missing out somewhere. So Absolutely. yeah, everybody else go check out the game and, and get involved. Yeah, we'd look forward to to definitely keeping an eye on the scene and uh, yeah, the community. Fantastic! Thanks for the time and uh, helping me uh, evangelize this amazing game. Hallelujah! Let's go. <laughs> We've long wanted to venture into three D printing. My curious mind just wants to invent all the things that I can use. Fortunately, Cody got there first, so I can just ask him all the questions so I don't have to spend the time or the money on this expensive hobby. So, Cody, you have succumbed to the dangerous hobby that is not gaming, but 3D printing. <laughs> how, yes. How, how deep are you in now? Um, I'm, I'm probably about this deep. <laughs> Look, it's like World of Warcraft back in the day. You know what you need to avoid if you want to get sucked into a world of lots of fun, but also some pain and suffering. So what, yes. what fun have you got? What did you, I mean, in the, I, I don't know much. We've got an article of you that is out uh, on nag.co.za by the time you're watching this video, just kind of yep. your journey into it. So we don't have to go into all the details. But uh, tell us a little bit about the puppy that you bought. Yeah, cool. Uh, so... A little while ago, I kind of got into uh, tabletop gaming and we needed a few miniature figurines. Mm. And I think, you know, kind of from there, as you're looking for new and cool kind of guys to play with on the board, uh, you kind of naturally land up in the 3D printing world of things and then, you know, slowly but surely just slide deeper and deeper down that hole until you land up buying one. <laughs> So now is your thing just printing stuff? Is that your, is that your, now your, you, you, you're just continually thinking about the next thing to print? <laughs> yeah, I will say my day is kind of scheduled around um, load shedding and then trying to get the time in so that I can pop a quick print on so it can print before load shedding kicks in mm -hmm. or yeah, before the next, uh, next game day so we've got something printed and hopefully not failed. <laughs> Uh, can you run a game. can you run a power supply on these things, or does it suck up too much juice? Yeah, so I do have um, a UPS on it just uh, for more to save the thing than to keep it running. Okay. Um, so oh, you can pull the print, or you can like. Yeah, it like does actually have like a, um, a a print pause feature, and then it does have a accidental power failed feature so when it turns back on it will resume your print uh, we have tested that out a little bit but it kind of leaves like a little line hmm. sometimes so we got the ups to kind of prevent that so but what, yeah. what did you print did you, did you end up getting so i mean you know you can obviously read the article to go a little bit more in depth but we landed up picking up a resin printer um, from any cubic and it is the Mono M3, so it's a 4K plus printer. Um, prints, I want to say, this big-ish, it's about 15 centimeters or so. Um, yeah, pretty decent. You can get like 10 to 12 kind of figures printed at one time. Oh, that's like, cool. Yeah, eight what hours, six to eight hours. 
That's not bad. Well, what is the first yeah. thing you printed? Was it something dirty that we can't discuss on air, or <laughs> is it an actual like, red or something? <laughs> I mean, the, um, unexcitingly, the first thing we printed was a test kind of little uh, thing that shows you if your settings are dialed in, because that's a whole other story. Oh, is that a little uh, dice looking square thing that people normally print? It grooves in yeah, it. it's kind of, well, the one we printed to like a little town, and it's got a whole bunch of little oh. buildings and things on it. Um, oh. Yeah, it's cute, and it came out right. Uh, Second try, we got right on the second try. So, have you have you printed anything worthy of showing to everybody? I do have some stuff that's worthy, and I will definitely uh, send you some B-roll of what we've got. I try to get a few badges going, but I'm still uh, is there anything figuring in front of those guys out. Proof, proof of life. What? what oh, is proof of life. I don't up. have. I have nothing in front of me right now. The printer. How is, far? How far is it? Do you need to run away and get it, or? <laughs> No, it's in a secret location. We don't tell anyone where it is, just in case they ask us to print things for them. A B-roll better be good, man. <laughs> I want to It'll be good. Thread It'll or be fiber good. coming out of that. <laughs> yeah, so no, would you recommend see. it to anybody? I mean, it's a, it's an expensive hobby, but um, it can be hell of a rewarding, I can imagine, to actually print functional things, but also, yeah, just have fun with board game figurines. I mean, that's a cool, cool way of using it. Yeah, so I mean... I picked it up for the board gaming and I'm quite blown away at how good it is. I didn't expect it to be as good. Like the print quality that comes out of this thing and the details on the figurines are absolutely amazing. Um, there are a few uh, places where you could get stuck, uh, you know, some failed prints that are quite disheartening. But I think if you just keep at it and figure it out, it's very, very rewarding. I know it's expensive, and um, but if it's something you enjoy doing, then I don't feel like it's a waste, you know. Isn't most hobbies ultimately exactly the deeper you go into it? Frisbee yeah. golf, you are going to end up spending thousands. I've heard stories. Yeah, I mean those carbonite frisbees or those carbon fiber frisbees. Sorry, I'm sure they're like at least as much as a 3D printer. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So let's keep it safe and into gaming. But um, so we'll check in with you again in a couple of weeks to see how it's gone. For anybody else, check out the articles that you'll be writing too. You'll be writing some weekly reports and feedback and some interesting things about 3D printing that hopefully people will learn from your mistakes. Yeah, hopefully I don't make too many mistakes. Um, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, catch you next week. Cool, thanks. Ciao. And that's it for episode 12 of The Nag Show. As always, if you'd like to be a part of the show and give us a review on a game or gaming hardware you think you've earned the right to talk about, then drop us a comment below or email us at hey at nagshow.co.za and we could invite you on. You could also send us a voice note or video comment to our WhatsApp number and you could be featured in an upcoming show. Until the next show, don't forget to check out all our channels across YouTube, Facebook and Game Explorers, a channel on the Ayoba app. We've got a family of over 200,000 viewers and readers, so come in and join the fun. Nag out.